It is the pastor's heart and Dominic Steele and thanks for joining us today. One Timothy two and key issues in the scholarly debate about that passage with Dr. Lionel Windsor. It would be a tough contest, but I think it might be the most controversial New Testament passage. There has been an enormous amount of scholarly attention, especially over the last few decades. And there are practical questions in church life that we just cannot ignore. Uh, there are all sorts of issues swirling around the doctrine of creation, humanity, our stance towards the world's cultural issues. Lionel Windsor is a New Testament lecturer at Sydney's Moore Theological College. He teaches the pastoral epistles to third year students amongst other things and so he's abreast of that scholarly debate. He gave a super helpful seminar a few months ago at the Priscilla and Aquila conference held by Moore College and uh, we have linked to that in the show notes and he's agreed to come in today and answer questions. Uh, Lionel, the pastor and your heart for us pastors. Um, 1 Timothy 2, it does seem overwhelming. It feels like if I go near it and preach in it, I'm just going to be touching a lightning rod and get mm. electrocuted. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Is, is it like it's that a, for you as a college Oh, lecturer? it certainly is. It's like that for anyone who's in any kind of pastoral ministry or really, really anywhere. Uh, I, I chose to do this uh, because obviously I teach the pastoral epistles at, at Moore College. I was so grateful for uh, Jane's, um, as, as Jane runs the uh, Priscilla and Aquila uh, conference. I was so grateful that she was uh, willing to, to have this um, in as part of the, mm. uh, the conference. We were looking at the idea of lazy complementarianism and how we can actually think um, really hard about working together as men and women. So what are the elephants in the room as we get closer and closer to 1 Timothy 2? Yes. So actually in the, uh, uh, as I was preparing for this, I was thinking, what are the big elephants in the room? And I actually identified 16. I'm not going to list all of them. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> We've only got 29 minutes left. Exactly. <laughs> that's right. But uh, I think that's helpful to think there's actually a herd of elephants in the room with us. Yep. And so some of them are cultural. Some of them are, uh, have to do with um, our, just our context. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are, there are cultural issues. I mean, some of the elephants in the room are just simply that, um, we uh, live in a society uh, that has had massive shifts in the mm. last at least 100 years, yep. uh, perhaps the last 50 years in terms of uh, the way that uh, men and women uh, relate and work in society. Yep. That's one of the, the, the elephants in the room. Another elephant in the room is a scholarly elephant in the room, uh, and that is that simply because this is a controversial topic, uh, so much scholarship has been created on it, uh, and because uh, that, that, that um, can just overwhelm us and can make us think, well, we need to just listen to the experts. Unless I've, no, unless I've read every book, how can I... How can I ever yeah, yeah. actually <laughs> make a decision on this? That's right. And uh, part of that is, is actually simply because controversial topics have lots written on them because mm -hmm. they get lots published on them. Publishers love controversial topics. Right. Uh, and so uh, anything that's controversial will generate a huge amount of scholarship. Uh, there's a whole lot of other um, issues and elephants in the room as well, one of, one of which is that we can be very polarised in our world and we're very polarised on this particular issue. Uh, we all want to paint ourselves as victims. That's mm -hmm. kind of how it works. So both, um, I guess, broadly complementarians and egalitarians. And everyone wants to say that we're the underdog who needs to uh, be, be listened to. Um, so I've just, I list a whole lot of those uh, elephants in the room. I want to say that uh, that can sound negative, And in one sense it is, it can be very overwhelming. But there's also a positive uh, aspect to that. And that is, and this is what I say to our students, if you actually engage with the issues in 1 Timothy 2, you're actually engaging with so many cultural and theological issues mm -hmm. and biblical issues uh, that actually you could, you could almost um, uh, engage with the, 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 so much of theology and culture in the Bible just by looking at the issues that arise from 1 Timothy 2. Mm -hmm. uh, on the flip side, that means that if you don't engage with 1 Timothy 2 uh, and feel like you can just take it and stick it you know, in a little box mm. and never deal with it, well, it'll always just keep popping out of the box because it uh, intersects with questions to do with what is a man, what is a woman. It's got to do with what is church? What are we doing in church? What's preaching? What are sermons? Uh, what's sin? How does it relate to the new creation? There's just all these questions that keep coming up uh, as we engage with the questions in 1 Timothy 2. So what are the main questions in the scholarly debates? Okay, what are the main questions? Like I say, uh, well, sorry, like I said about the, the elephants in the room, <laughs> I identified them. There about thirty of them. Exactly, <laughs> that's right. Um, and so I could pick. I could pick a, a, a few um, of of the big ones, mm -hmm. um, and and there's other ones as well. Uh, one of the big ones is what is one Timothy? Um, what's going on in one Timothy as Paul writes 
his letter uh, to Timothy in Ephesus. So uh, w- there's, there's sort of two broad lines of thought on that um, in, the, in the scholarship. One broad line of thought is that uh, Paul is writing to Timothy to oppose a false teaching. He, he's obviously writing to oppose a false teaching, mm. that's quite clear. Is the false teaching he opposes a, a false teaching that is general and is, is denying the goodness of God's created order? Uh, in general, mm-hmm. as comes up in, say, 1 Timothy chapter 4, those yeah, who... Those first few verses there. Those first few verses, those who deny food and, you know, deny marriage, forbid marriage, etc. Um, is it that sort of just general, a denial of the goodness of God's created order, uh, in which case it is generally quite applicable to us? You know, mm-hmm. we, we can't necessarily take absolutely every word and just sort of woodenly apply it to us, but it is quite applicable to us. The other uh, question and the other the sort of the, the answer to that question is, no, what Paul's doing is he's actually opposing quite a, a specific issue that's very specific to Ephesus. It's culturally there. To. It's not relevant in Sydney today. That's right. Yeah. And, and that, that's exactly right. The, the, the issue um, has to do with a particular background. And often this comes from scholarly reconstructions where scholars look and they look at, say, Ephesus. You look at Acts chapter 19, you see that they worshipped Artemis. There was the cult of Artemis. And then you can go and you can look and you can see that they were right. Well, they were rioting as well in Ephesus. You can see that the cult of Artemis did um, have elements that exalted women over men. And so some scholars will say, well, what's going on in, uh, in Ephesus at the time as Paul is writing is that there's this false teaching that exalts women over men. It sees that, um, you know, that the teaching that comes from Artemis sees that women were created first, perhaps. Uh, and it says that um, women are too, uh, are getting too sort of bossy or too mm-hmm. overbearing. Um, and that's actually coming from the Artemis cult. And so in that view, what's, what Paul's doing in 1 Timothy is he's saying, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. You know, men and women are equal together. Uh, and then when he gets to 1 Timothy 2, what he's doing is he's saying, look, at the moment, I just want to make sure that um, women aren't teaching because they're more likely to be influenced by this Artemis cult. And so they need to not teach um, until they actually learn what's true doctrine um, and then whatever, they can, they can go and teach after that. So, uh, so, so if it's a very, very specific issue that's going on in Ephesus at the time, um, and this comes from these scholarly reconstructions, uh, then 1 Timothy is less directly applicable to us and our mm-hmm. own situation. We would just say, if we, if we find Artemis cult worshippers in our midst, uh, then maybe we would do the same thing, but we, we wouldn't uh, otherwise. Uh, so that's that's a kind of a, a big issue. So, w- which way do you go? Yeah. Why? So w- where I go, as I as I look at it, I actually um, think that firstly, many of these scholarly reconstructions are built on uh, supposition after supposition. So mm-hmm. p- p- people will say, "Well, there was an Artemis cult in in Ephesus." Yes, there was. And they exalted women over men. Well, yeah, probably, perhaps some did. And the main teachers of the Artemis cult were women. Uh, not sure, but okay. And then the next plank of that argument is, and that is the main thing that Paul's dealing with in Ephesus because Paul's writing to, to Ephesus. But I don't really see that in 1 Timothy. I don't see he doesn't refer to the Artemis cult, firstly. Secondly, he never uh, actually, uh, when he does refer to false teachers, he's referring to uh, generally men. So those who are false teachers are men. There's someone who's written a book recently, again, with suppositions just to say that, um, oh no, you know, the, the only men who were false teachers have been banished from the community already. But then when I look at it, I go, no, there's a whole lot of uh, masculine participles in there when it's referring to the false teachers in verses five and six. Basically, I mean, you don't see that so much in English, but you do see it in Greek there. Mm. It could be women are involved as well. But it seems that the false teachers were men. And so it doesn't really seem likely that Paul is sort of issuing a blanket ban on all women uh, teaching just so that he can stamp out this Artemis cult, Mm. which is we, you know that, that's a that's a very much a summary of um, and, and a generalisation about some of those scholarly views. Mm. So that's one scholarly issue. You know, yeah. the background. <laughs> to, <laughs> to it. You've yeah. also got an issue that quite a few of the scholars, um, well, aren't evangelical and some aren't believers. 
Well, that is something that we just need to be careful of. Uh, so it is certainly true. So when I'm talking about these particular debates, I actually had focused on the kind of the broadly evangelical debates between uh, com evangelical complementarians mm -hmm. and evangelical egalitarians. But we need to be very careful when we're reading the scholarly literature on 1 Timothy uh, and the pastoral epistles that much of the critical scholarship doesn't even believe that Paul wrote the pastoral yep. epistles. Mm -hmm. um, and in one sense, I, I saw that, I, I put it to one side a little bit, mm -hmm. because that would just open up a whole other can of worms as well. Yep. Uh, but that is true as well. So we are affected by, by that as mm. well. Yep. Let me give you a couple of the bullet points that I picked up from yeah. engaging with your seminar. Mm. Um, uh, the first one is just this, this word in 1 Timothy to quietness. Um, mm. We get it in... Um, uh, right at the start of the chapter and then in chapter verses 10 or 11, yeah. Mm, yes, um, you see it at the start of the chapter, then you see it in verse 11, quietness. So at the start of the chapter, quietness um, is referring uh, to, so uh, basically Paul is asking for prayer for, uh, for the purpose of living a peaceful and quiet life, mm -hmm. leading a peaceful and quiet life. That's actually referring to both men and women mm -hmm. there. Um, and what he's uh, saying there is, I, I think it makes most sense to put this in the context of God being the God of all creation. Mm -hmm. And if he's the God of all creation, uh, in fact, as he goes on to, to talk, he says that uh, Jesus Christ is the one who became a human being so that all <laughs> human beings might be saved. And uh, there's that very broad um, uh, view that Paul has of all creation. This is another really important point that I want to make. And that is that all of this is grounded not just in some kind of um, misogynistic or you know view about women. Mm -hmm. What it's actually grounded in is in the mission of the gospel that's based on the lordship of the Lord Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. And if we get nothing out of else out of this, that's uh, what I'd love us to get out of it. That Paul is the preacher and teacher, quite importantly, of the nations. Mm -hmm. uh, he wants to teach about the Lord Jesus Christ, and part of that is that we need to pray for all those in authority. The word all comes up, the word hum humanity comes up. Um, and part of that is that as Christians, we are to live peaceful and quiet lives. That doesn't mean silent lives. It doesn't mean, you know, we, we just shut up. What it means is that we are living in light of this created order as opposed to either escaping from that created order or uh, being people who are opposed to the created order. And that includes, that created order includes just living under the, the governments that God's given us generally. And it's the same word, is it? The verse two word to the verse... Uh, it's the same root word, yeah. yeah. The, the hesuchion in verse two. Uh, and then in verse uh, 11, it's that uh, I want a woman to uh, learn, uh, or sorry, let a woman learn in quietness, has yeah. mm. So and, the quietness, then, I think, then, is... I yeah. mean, I, I do notice in some of the English translations it has, she is to be silent, do you know? That, yeah, that, I that think... That just sounds harsh. It, you know? it certainly does. And there are other words for silence. So uh, in Titus, Paul talks about silencing false teachers. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he actually used the word muzzle or something. He used the word that more obviously means, you know, not actually saying anything, being you, silent. You know the people who do the Bible translations. Why don't you tell them to use a better <laughs> word? <laughs> I don't know. They're uh, your peers and friends. <laughs> well, I, don't, I, I haven't actually looked at the NIV. I've got a friend who's um, no, on the it, committee. It, it, yeah. it, it's, uh, actually, yeah. I haven't seen the 2011 version, but the, two th mm. the, the one before said she mm. must be silent. Okay, you know? yeah. yeah, yeah. So we always... Um, uh, I, I think as we look in more in more care and detail at these passages, uh, we always have um, you know questions that we need to ask about: Are we translating it rightly? Mm. Um, and that is actually why we teach Greek at Moore College. Mm. I mean, I'm just I've got yeah. the, the yeah. Holman out in front in front yeah. of me, and it, it says, "I do not allow a woman to teach or have authority over men. Instead, she is to be silent." Do you know? Okay. So what what is what's important is Was it, well, I think it, you're yeah. saying quiet is. The word, is the name. I think the word is quiet, and, and also and I want to say just for a moment, or just yeah, it? yeah, yeah. Be, being quiet in the sense of a, uh, there's a quietness of attitude there. And I'm very, very grateful as as I've looked at this. Um, there's there's some summaries, and I refer to these in my in my uh, video in the paper. Yep. I refer to uh, Claire Smith's work. Yep. I also refer to some egalitarian writers. Yep. But uh, I think Claire Smith, she's the, her book um, God's Good Design. Yep. It's written f uh, for an easy read. And she does a great job of that. But what that can disguise is the huge amount of scholarship mm. that's behind that book. Uh, and not only that book, but, um, you know, Claire's, Claire's PhD is, you know, so thick. Yep. Uh, and what she's done is deliberately looked at the terminology of learning and teaching in the 
uh, new, in the New Testament, but particularly in 1 Corinthians and in the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. And uh, she's looked at the idea of the educational terminology. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the word, uh, one, one of the key words that comes up then is the word both learn, verse 11, man thaneto, that is uh, to, to learn, um, let a woman learn. That's actually a positive thing. Mm. You know, it's not um, let her learn so that she can go on to teach. That's not necessarily what Paul says. He says, let her learn. That's a positive thing. Mm. Education is a good thing. Um, but uh, the key and, word, the that for everyone, let them learn. Well, yeah. Absolutely. That's right. And so the point is not that uh, women should learn and men shouldn't. The point is that um, in, in this context, that women are to learn. That's, that's important. And the, there's a particular attitude that Paul gives in terms of quietness and uh, submissiveness there. But then um, the key word in verse 12, uh, didaskane, which is the first word in verse 12. Now, that's that means to teach. Mm-hmm. We don't see it as the first word in verse 12 in English translations, mm-hmm. uh, which is why we want to keep getting our students who are going to be pastors to learn Greek and to mm-hmm. remember Greek. We don't see it as the first word because, um, you know, the way that English works, you can't, e- you can't easily make it the first word just to, because of word order. But it is the key and prominent word in verse mm. 12, to daskane, to teach. Um, now, um, So it's to teach a woman, not I permit. Exactly, yes. Which sounds weird. Yeah. yeah. And um, But word order does matter, uh, mm-hmm. especially in terms of prominence. Uh, now, uh, here, that word um, has had a lot of debate um, that's circled around it, mm-hmm. as well as its relation to a word that appears a little bit further on in the verse, which is authentane, which can mean either to assume authority or to, uh, to have authority. Uh, but the question of what that word means, didaskane, is, mm-hmm. is, uh, is, is exercised a lot of uh, questions. Well, what do they say? Okay, so here's, <laughs> here's four options, okay? Right. This is what I do in my paper. I just go, here's four options, yeah. but I want to say I, I think one of them's right, or I think there's a good reason to think that one of them's right. One option is didaskane, to teach, means uh, any time anybody says something so that somebody else learns something. Yeah. You know, to, to act in such a way that somebody learns something. Yeah. This is what uh, a woman shouldn't do, Paul is saying. She shouldn't commit the function of teaching. Uh, the function of teaching in any context. Yeah. Yeah, that mm-hmm. is in any possible you know, yeah. way. Yeah, that so is. A, yeah. a hard right interpretation. It can be, uh, yeah, I guess if you want to go on the political spectrum, it'd be a hard or a, a conservative spectrum. I, I don't know many people who, if you actually follow it through, um, it kind of means that, you know, women have to be careful not to, you know. If I'm, si- if I'm sitting in church next to you and you're singing. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Yeah. Now it's um, that's that's an extreme example. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's a very very strong um, uh, view. It's not taken by many scholars, but it is it is there, and it was there. It's there. It's actually taken by some uh, scholars who want to uh, straw man a little bit, yeah. and by other scholars who not quite want to straw man, but want to say, well, this is what Paul's saying, and obviously we can't do that. You know, um, that's the first one. Yeah. Uh, the second possibility is uh, this might sound cheeky, but I think it's right that the word didaskane translates quite well into the English word teach. Right. <laughs> and when I say that, that sounds very trite. But what I mean by that is that the English word teach has a range of meanings. Yeah. When I use the word teach, I, um, I can use it in various different settings. And the nature of, of and the relationships and the authority and all sorts of things that, that, that flow from it depend on the context in yeah. which I use it. So the word means to teach. Now, uh, you know, if you have any uh, actual teachers, you know, educationalists in, in, who are listening uh, to this, they'll know that the word teach can mean various things. It's an educational word. Uh, it's a word that is focused on um, students, on learners, learning something. Mm-hmm. This is what I very much learned from Claire, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Claire's taught me this yeah. in this way through her writing. Um, that le- uh, it, it, it's, it, it generally means uh, to, to have a focus, not so much on the material, you've got to use material, but it's got to have a focus on the learners that they will learn. So mm-hmm. it involves w- doing whatever you need to do so that they will learn uh, that material. But it can be used in different contexts. So in some contexts, so I'm, I'm a teacher at Moore College, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, sometimes I'll use the word teach in the context of I'm teaching the class, you know, mm-hmm. or I teach the class. Now, that means the nature of the relationship there is that my, my relationship with the class inherently involves authority. Mm-hmm. There. 
Uh, now, not absolute, not an absolute authority. My main authority is the Bible. That's mm. that's what really mm. matters, uh, and God's word is is what my main authority is. But there is a relationship of authority you do going say, on there. It's five past the hour. Let's start. And things, things like, like that. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. And and there's a, that that very much um, uh, yeah, subordinate to God's word, mm. but there is certainly an authority there. At the same time, in the class, I'll say to, to the students, yeah, I'll get in the groups. So I want you to teach one another. Mm-hmm. Or over morning tea, I want you to learn and teach from one another. Or, or over, the, over the lunchroom and that sort of thing. And I'll still use the word teach there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in that case, it's still uh, the idea of an educational process. Uh, but uh, because of the nature of the context and of the relationship, it does not necessarily carry the same weight of authority mm. uh, that the word teach when it's used in other contexts, um, that like, a, like a formal classroom context mm-hmm. identifying a teacher does. Now, I think that's what the word means here, most, most likely, and it's used in the context of a, uh, where, where, where Paul has actually set up the context already as a context of the formal gathered worship of church. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that comes through in verse 1, where he actually uses terminology to make prayers, uh, to make intercessions, to make thanksgivings. Um, that's, that's terminology and phrasing that is used of f- formal gatherings. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not just, I want you to just generally pray, you know, yep. in any, any context. And also there's other examples uh, as well, say in verse 8, you know, I want men uh, to pray in every place. And then there's the idea of the lifting holy hands Mm -hmm. in prayer. Uh, Setting up that context, we're talking about the formal um, gathering of God's people, Mm -hmm. probably in this place in in house churches, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Uh, So in that context, when the word teach is used, we're not just talking about any possible way in which a woman can or anyone can teach anybody else. We're actually talking about a particular activity that is occurring in those formal gatherings that is actually uh, carries a sense of authority um, and involves the teaching of people enabling them and helping them to learn. Uh, so that is, I think, more the traditional view. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the view that has um, you, know, you see in many um, older commentaries and mm-hmm. uh, you see it in Chrysostom and, and uh, many others. Uh, and it's, it's the view that I think Claire Smith argues for very well. Um, a third view has come about from about, I'm, I'm still investigating this and I really want to, but I think it's come about from about the 80s um, and it's an 1980s. The 1980s, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. May have been around before then, uh, through some German scholarship and through others. It's come about, and this is where I need to be a little, uh, you know, I need to talk a little bit about the history of scholarship, but only a tiny little bit. That is, uh, scholars have been very, very interested, for good reasons, in the fate of the Jesus traditions. Mm-hmm. So this is an interest that they've had. Why have they had that interest? Because we want to be confident that what we have in the Bible, especially from, from the lips of Jesus, um, is actually accurate and true. How do we know that it's accurate and true? Is this what Jesus actually said and taught? Well, we know it's accurate and true um, and the, the, because of the interest in scholarship in how those, trans, those traditions about Jesus, how those words of Jesus and teachings of Jesus and the actions of Jesus were transmitted by early Christians in the early Christians' communities. That is, maybe some of them were written down, Mm -hmm. um, but uh, very early on, a lot of it was, we might say, word of mouth. Mm -hmm. But in fact, word of mouth isn't the best way to talk about it because word of mouth sounds like it's a little bit dodgy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Actually, good um, transmission, it's called traditioning, the idea of traditioning. Yeah. Yeah, the idea of passing on traditions. And there's certain key words that are used for the passing on of traditions. Greek words, paralambano, paradidami. They're, they're words that Paul, but Paul uses. That's very important. You know, these traditions are, are passed on. Now, there's been an interest of scholarship in that. And there's been, particularly since the 1980s, people have asked, well, how were the traditions passed on? And who was doing the passing on of traditions? Now, uh, there's been a particular view uh, that the passing on of traditions was done by various people, but especially uh, the teachers in early Christian communities, they were instrumental in the mm-hmm. passing on of traditions. Other people will say that it was other people, but some people say it was the teachers in the early Christian communities who were doing that. The, um, that has then led to uh, a, a, few, a couple more sort of additions of, of logic. And the addition of logic is, well, okay, if the teachers, the people who were doing the teaching, Um, were also passing on tradition, then that will mean that these teachers had quite a heightened authority in their communities. They were like walking, talking Bibles. Mm -hmm. Because not only were they teaching, you know, didasco, 
they were also the ones who, if you actually wanted to, you didn't have a New Testament. If you wanted to know what Jesus said, you kind of had to ask them. Mm. Yeah. So um, they were both. They were not just teachers. They were also what's called tradents, those who pass on traditions. So some people from the, the 80s and following have argued that, um, well, when Paul says, um, I don't permit a woman to teach, uh, that's because the, uh, the teachers of the time had a very special authority. That's not true today because we've all got Bibles. You know, we can just you know, mm -hmm. um, look, look them up in front of us. And so the, the idea of authority isn't such a big thing. Uh, and so uh, it doesn't apply to us so much today. That's been, a, that's been an argument. So that's led then to another view, which I, th I think is a minority view, but it's led to another view that actually says, well, actually the word didaskain actually means pass on traditions. Traditioning. Yeah. Traditioning, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lay, down, lay down traditions. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it works for, for a number of reasons. One, one reason I think it works is as I looked at especially Claire's work, she, she really helpfully distinguishes um, uh, the passing on of traditions from the verb to teach. They're, of course they're connected, very much connected. You know, if you're going to teach something, you need to know what am I teaching? Yeah, yeah of course. Um, a little bit you know, like me, I, I'm involved in syllabus work. You know, I, I put syllabuses together. Yeah. Uh, but that's not the same as teaching. Yeah. yeah. Um, but some people have said that it's exactly the same thing. The second reason, actually, as I, as I reflect on it, is and that... you could be a teacher without being the syllabus director. Of course I could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can teach without being the syllabus director. That's right. Uh, another reason is that actually women passed on traditions in the early church. In fact, if you want to actually ask who were the people who are, are particularly well known uh, for passing on the traditions in the early church, um, some of the people who, who we know are people like Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. People like, I would argue, probably uh, Junior, who's mentioned in, in Romans 16. Yeah. Uh, witnesses to the resurrection. Uh, they were the ones who, uh, who, who have the traditions and they're passing them on. And you actually read about that, that happening. So I actually think if you are saying um, that uh, there is, you know, that women, are, Paul's excluding women from that, I'm going to ask why. It's yeah. a bit strange. Yeah. Um, maybe some might argue... to go for the people with the best memories. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that's right, yeah. That's, that's right. So I don't think that's what he's and actually... And our marriage is definitely my wife. <laughs> <laughs> in, indeed, indeed. And, and indeed, um, you know, there's, there's that argument that actually there was a prejudice against women in the ancient world yeah. that they weren't reliable witnesses. Yeah. Um, and so it's actually, you know, as some people point out, for good apologetic reasons... If you were going to choose somebody to make up a story about who was the original witnesses of the resurrection and good, you know, passing on a tradition, you wouldn't choose women. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's, a, that's a, a slightly separate argument. But I think for, for that reason, that's what the desco actually uh, means. Uh -huh. uh, what's it, how's I it got mean, to... One yeah, of the things sorry. that jumped out at me engaging with your seminar mm. was that although that argument got a bit of traction a couple of years ago, yeah. you're saying now really scholarship has moved on from that argument. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, that argument is is not as when I when I look at the key uh, sort of the, the most popular and when I when I say most popular, I'm talking outside you know the Sydney context. I'm yeah. actually talking about especially the American scene, um, yeah. the UK scene, the English speaking world mainly is what I'm looking yeah. at. Um, uh, then probably the the bigger the the key arguments more come from the, uh, what you call the egalitarian perspective, yeah. which is a little bit more uh, closely related to what I, I outlined at the beginning to yeah. do with the, the very specific application to do with the Artemis cult yeah. and the women who are teaching. Um, that idea of- That's um, getting more traction. That, uh, yeah, that, is, that is getting more traction and it's the more, the more common and, and regular um, argument. Right. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the other argument is worth, dealing with and I want to do some more work on it. I think Claire's done some great work on it, but I want to follow up on that sure. as well. Yeah. Um, there's also discussion about the um, the ude in, uh, the that is in... Mm. Um, yeah, ude, I yeah. do not Hands allow not. a woman to teach that is or to, or to have, or what's going on with that um, mm. conjunction? Yeah. So there's two uh, of these uh, key uh, verbs. There's to teach, I do not permit a woman, or to teach a woman, I do not permit. Then we've got this word ude, and I'll keep it as ude for yeah. a minute. And then we've got another word, authentane, that comes mm -hmm. after that. 
Uh, Authentane has got a bit of a debate as well. You know, yeah. and actually, when you look at the King James Version, some of the earlier the versions, they would say to, to usurp authority. Mm -hmm. um, others will say, some of the more modern versions might say to take, uh, to, sorry, to have authority. Um, that is, it's a more neutral word. Yeah. The question is, what is the relationship be between to teach and to have or, and to, have or to usurp yeah. authority? Now, there's an argument uh, that those two words are so closely related that they basically refer to the same thing, and you can't understand the word didaskane um, unless it's restricted by the word authentane. What I mean by that is, some people will say that the word to teach actually is, I don't permit a woman to teach in a way that usurps authority. Yeah. And what, what that means is that uh, what Paul is saying is, oh, I'm fine for a woman to teach. No, no issue generally with a woman to teach, that's fine. What I'm saying is, I don't permit a woman to teach in a way that usurps authority. And the reason that he's saying that is because, and it'll go back to the sort of the Artemis cult, there were women who were teaching in a very usurping of authority way, a very riotous way, a way that was, you know, overturning things. And, belligerent and, kind yeah, of way. But yeah, a really belligerent way and just trying to, and they were doing it in that kind of Artemis way to say that women are more important than men and et cetera. Um, so that, that's um, one way of taking it. Another way of taking it is that the word ude just means or in a very... Um, just the sense of there's, there's two things that Paul's talking about here. He's talking about to teach. I don't permit a woman to teach. That's one thing I don't permit a woman to do. And then another thing I don't permit a woman to do is or to do this other thing. That is to have or to usurp authority. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the problem with that view is that um, the word ude generally means that it's got to do with a progression from one thing to another. Yeah. So I, I think you think, think the word to teach, what Paul's saying is the primary thing, the thing at the beginning of the clause is, I don't permit a woman to teach. And then he's saying, and so neither to usurp authority. That is, it's a logical progression from one to the other. That is, yeah. if a woman were in this context to teach in this particular way, in this, sorry, in this particular context, then that would involve the taking of authority, the having authority, or the usurping of authority. And actually, in the end, it doesn't mean, matter whether it means usurping authority or having authority. Uh, what Paul's saying is, um, in this context, uh, it, it, the, the same words used in, um, in, in, the, in the Gospels, where Jesus talks about, uh, lay up treasures for yourselves in heaven, not on earth, where thieves break in and steal. It's, um, uh, or where thieves do not break in or steal. Uh, uh, so in heaven, where thieves do not break in or steal, it's the same idea. There's you know there's a logical progression from yeah, one yeah, to the yeah. other. Yeah, mm. uh, but it's not it's not the idea of to teach. Uh, you know, to teach stands on its own. I don't permit a woman to teach. Uh, but then there's a logical progression to the next thing, and that is that will that will actually mean the usurping of authority. But it doesn't mean that Paul's fine for a woman to you know, well, in, in this point, to, to teach in this context, as long as she doesn't usurp authority. That's not what the word means. It's, it's almost inevitable. It's an, like an inevitable consequence. That's right. right. Yeah. yeah. Now, that's a scholarly um, question, a scholarly issue that I want to do some more work on. Well, what, uh, what's your preliminary thinking here? Yeah. Well, that, that's, I, I, I think it's, it, it is that. That Uda is a progression marker. Right. And, yeah. and so that is that. Um, and when you look at the clause, you know, the Daskane is really close to the start of the clause. The Athentane appears later. Uh, and so Paul's, what that means is that Paul's primary interest here has got to do with the dynamics of speaking and hearing, of learning and teaching. And secondarily, um, he's interested in, in what we might call authority, and that's important. Um, and that, that sort of moves on to verses 13 to 15. So what would your preferred English translation of that conjunction be? It's, it's very hard, but I would say at this point, so neither. That, so I do not permit a woman to teach, so neither to have authority over. Yeah, okay. yeah. Mm, that's how I take it at this point. Right. Now, what I'm doing at this point is saying I want to do some more work. I actually receive that, that, that view... Um, very, very helpfully, uh, I got from reading an egalitarian <laughs> who raised it and then said, well, it can't be that. I went, right. well, actually, I think it might be. <laughs> there. Now, Lionel, I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to go down the line of verses 13, 14 and 15, um, but... Uh, we're running out of time. I noticed in your seminar, you took a great deal of time to say, uh, I'm not going to teach you about 
applying things <laughs> and <laughs> what it means. You know. yeah. But I want to know, <laughs> of course what yeah. should I do? What do you do? <laughs> yes. How, exactly. how does it land? How do you reckon mm, this yeah. should land yes. in congregational life today? That's yeah. right. And yes, we do. I, I think I would just would run a whole another hour and a quarter about how we, how we land it. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so as I, as I look at this passage, I think it tells us something, but definitely not everything about the way that we are to relate together as men and women, um, particularly when it comes to the ministry of God's word. Uh, and uh, I think there's a reasonably straightforward um, application to what we call the sermon, mm -hmm. in, at least in my context, yep. probably your context. I don't know if there's other contexts where the sermon can mean something else, but mm -hmm. I think there's a reasonably straightforward application to that. Having said that, um, it is important for us to look at so many of the other passages that are there in the Bible that do value the, the, the voices of women and the input of women and, and mm -hmm. learning from women. One of the ways that we are quite deliberately seeking to do this at Moore College, um, and I've been wanting to do this even before I started at Moore College, is to work out ways that in our, our services uh, and indeed in our, uh, our teaching, uh, we can do that in, in a genuinely complementarian way. Mm. You know, the lazy complementarian will say, the lazy complementarian man <laughs> will say, uh, and I'm guilty of this, okay? Uh, it's too late, just got to give a sermon. Okay, I'll just give it. Mm -hmm. uh, but one, thing, one of the things we need to do is to think further about this. How can we actually include um, others, including women, uh, in, in our teaching? Now that actually in involves having to be prepared. Mm -hmm. It involves actually having to think in advance, to chat in advance. Uh, one of the things I've tried to do is my, my uh, very good colleague and, and friend Susan uh, at, at college. Uh, Susan's the Dean of Women, is also my co-chaplain. Uh, I, um, I was up to preach on 1 Timothy 5, 1 to 16 um, mm -hmm. uh, recently. It was, we were looking at widows, uh, mm -hmm. looking at the question of the order of widows. And I really wanted to have very much Susan's input, not just for myself, but for everybody uh, in that. So what I chose to do is to sit down with Susan. Uh, we, we talked about it. Susan had some very good pastoral insights into, mm -hmm. into the passage. Uh, I chose to take off um, about six or seven minutes from what I was going to preach, which left me with, I don't know, 13, 14 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to um, have Susan uh, to give some reflections and really helpful insights into mm -hmm. that passage. You can see it on the Moore College website uh, now mm -hmm. what we did. Uh, to do that, I wanted to, to listen to what Susan had to say. Susan and I, we worked together on this uh, and then we presented. And I, I, I guess I preached the sermon. Susan gave reflections, but it was integrated mm. uh, into that. And that's what we're deliberately seeking to do uh, in such a way that it's quite clear and obvious that there is a teaching going on. Uh, but that teaching is not just a sort of a, a, a simple one size fits all um, black and white kind of one dimensional thing. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're seeking to do to be complementarian, truly. Now that passage, 1 mm. Timothy 5, um, uh, there's clearly a gender application mm, um, yes. in that passage. Yes. Would you do that in, I don't know, um, uh, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, whereas it doesn't mm. feel like that passage is a a one with a particular I may gender well, application. I may well do it. Absolutely. Yeah. And it would actually depend. Um, the reason I, one of the reasons I did it just because I'm, I'm just preaching through 1 Timothy in yep. chapel and I get two goes in chapel <laughs> this year. Yep. And that passage, you know, um, was just, just an obvious thing that I wanted to get input on. But yes, um, to, to get um, uh, men's and women's insights together. Uh, a book by Jane, uh, Jane, uh, Jane Tour um, uh, and, and um, her co-author, whose name now escapes me Graham now. Banyan. Graham, Graham Banyan, yeah. Yep. Uh, called uh, Embracing Complementarianism, talks about all sorts of different ways in which the, uh, the ministry of and the wonderful contribution of men and women together, uh, we can work on together in our, in our context. Cool. Thanks very much for coming in. Thanks, Dominic. My guest on The Pastor's Heart, Dr. Lionel Windsor. He's a lecturer in New Testament at Sydney's Moore Theological College. And I do go and check out that seminar that he presented on uh, at the uh, Priscilla and Aquila uh, conference earlier in the year uh, on uh, a range of scholarly perspectives on 1 Timothy 2 and uh, listen to the full 90 minute treatment and thanks for joining us we will look forward to your company next Tuesday afternoon. Mm -hmm.